Okay. So I'll begin by introducing Mr. Abdelaziz Al Mulla. So Mr. Abdelaziz Al Mulla, he is the founder and the CEO of Madar Farms. Uh, his interest in food security began during his time at McKinsey and Co. Uh, where he was working extensively with GCC governments addressing a variety of national risk challenges. He is a serial investor in disruptive technologies um, and he's dedicated to addressing the food security challenge. He dedicates time to the region's food ecosystem as a mentor at Savoir Ventures, which is the Middle East's first accelerator focused on food. He was previously a banker with HSBC. He holds a BA from the University of Pennsylvania and an MBA from Wharton. So welcome. Uh, so uh, in this course, uh, so this, this talk is uh, part of a course called Manos of Machina, where we are exploring the relationship between humans and technology, you know, throughout history. Uh, but we're also, uh, you know, looking at speculative futures uh, and what that means, uh, what, how technology will be in our lives um, in the future. So welcome, and uh, I'll hand it over to you. Great. So thanks again uh, for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as mentioned, my name is Abdelaziz al I'm the founder and CEO of Madar Farms. I've got a short presentation prepared. The point of the presentation is just to give you an introduction about what we do, um, who we are, uh, and kind of what, what we're looking to do in the future and the problems we're trying to solve. Uh, I'm going to try and go through it as concisely and briefly as possible so that we have as much time for Q&A because uh, I'd rather have a conversation than speaking one way into the screen. Uh, so please uh, uh, feel free to share your questions uh, when we're done. Um, so I'll just go ahead and share my screen. Can you just confirm me a thumbs up if you can see it? Awesome. All right, so uh, just to start with, I'm sure, uh, you know, on your mind uh, is the question of ACTEC. So first off, ACTEC is really just a fancy word for the intersection of agriculture and technology. And, um, you know, agriculture traditionally uh, hasn't really been disrupted over the last hundred years. In the last hundred years, agriculture has pretty much stayed the same. It's been a commoditized mass production method. And uh, what we're doing at Madar Farms is trying to look at it uh, in a new way. So to start off with what, what's the problem that we're trying to solve? Um, and uh, here in the UAE, um, you know, uh, and globally, the problem is actually quite the same. The numbers look very much the same. And it's terrifying because we all know we have a food problem, but even its impact on water. Globally, more than 70% of fresh water use is actually for agriculture. Uh, here in the UAE, in the wider region, uh, that's almost more than 80% uh, actually. Uh, despite the fact that we are not an agriculturally producing region typically, um, you know, and we all know the impact of climate change on agriculture, the fact that we're overusing pesticides and insecticides, which is decreasing actually in the long term our farmer yields uh, through uh, chemical runoffs and through damaging the underlying ground. But it's also almost a, a contributor of almost a third to global greenhouse gases. So we're stuck in this like vicious circle of trying to produce more and trying to overcome it and address it, but actually adding to the problem. And, you know, this, despite all these efforts and trying to produce more, a significant portion of food is wasted. Now, globally, that's a, that's a, that's a 38% number, but in this region, in some areas, that number can go up to 80%. Uh, and that problem is because there are challenges across the entire value chain. It's not just about production. This is very, very important. We may be focused on the production side, but the problem is across the value chain in delivery and storage and, and presentation and such. And, you know, despite, again, all of these efforts in the, this region, more than 90% of our food is imported. And that's totaling a cost of around $8.4 billion today. But that number could escalate to up to a trillion dirhams uh, within the next 10 years. Uh, you know, it doesn't take a math genius to, to figure out that these numbers don't add up. We're overusing our water, we're not producing enough, and what we're producing, a lot of it is being wasted, and we're damaging the environment and contributing to the problem uh, as we go along. You know, conventional farming in the way that we're doing it, it's just not sustainable. And we need to think about a new way to approach it. 
And that's really where Actex starts to come in. And when we first started, we were very much speaking, I think, into a vacuum. Uh, five, six years ago, this problem wasn't as widely focused on as it is today. And the COVID pandemic has definitely been a tragic event, but one of the uh, one of the uh, kind of benefits that's come out of it is this focus on domestic food production, this focus on food security. And it's not, you know, again, not a local, national or regional one, but a global focus. We saw that supply chain crunch. Uh, we saw the kind of protectionist responses between countries trying to protect and focus on their national needs and having an impact across the globe. Uh, we saw those prices start to jump up. But as a result, we saw a massive, massive, massive shift in public policy. Uh, we saw institutions being created. We saw policies being implemented for local production. And what's really happened is this, it's allowed us in a way uh, to provide an opportunity for us to really take the next step uh, in our evolution and think about long-term uh, sustainability in a self-sustainability and resilient way. Um, so thinking about what are the kind of spectrum of solutions from a production point of view and then what we do, uh, it's really a spectrum. Uh, and we start kind of with the outdoor, outdoor farming all the way up to the extreme end of what we do, which is controlled environment agriculture. Now, one thing I want to stress is the fact that there is no one-stop solution. There is a place to produce in every type of farming. But the introduction of technology allows us to shift certain products away from typical ways of farming. You know, with agriculture, your, your outdoor agriculture methods, your typical kind of land-based or sea-based uh, farming, you know, there is a space for them, but they're heavily, heavily reliant on chemicals, on natural freshwater resources. And it's obviously all exposed to the wider environment and the rapidly changing wider environment. But more than anything, the supply and demand gap globally is growing. We're just not keeping up with population growth. And so greenhouses has been kind of the promise of the next step in that evolution. But greenhouses have been around for a long time. They've actually been around in Holland for almost 500 years. Uh, but there's a space for them. You know, uh, there is a certain level of control that they provide. Uh, there is a certain basic level of climate uh, irrigation, a certain uh, provision and opportunity to be a bit more resource saving. And so again, depending on the product portfolio, we can upskill it uh, up into that space. And then finally, there's what we do, which is the extreme end of technology and optimized control, which is indoor farming, where we take the control environment and actually control it to the maximum. Uh, we close out our system, uh, and I'm gonna talk about what that looks like, but the, the key takeaways is that it is the most sustainable way of growing um, it allows us to grow things in places we couldn't before and widen our product range as much as possible. But also most importantly, in terms of scalability, anything we do, if we're looking at the scale of the problem, has to be done at a massive scale. That kind of problem has to be tailored with a solution that we can build out rapidly, build out consistently in order to address it both in a financially feasible manner but also a long-term social sustainable impact manner. Um, so what is indoor farming and kind of CEA? Um, so this is a very simplistic kind of uh, little drawing of what we do uh, and a breakdown of all the different elements. But you know, the real takeaway is we're growing indoors, fully indoors, fully closed environment. There is no exposure to the outside elements. And what that means, and we have to recreate the environment that the plants need inside the farm. And what that means is it's an opportunity for us not only to recreate the basic needs, but to optimize the environment to give the plants the optimal uh, provision of what they need and grow it in the best way. So that means that when we give them the nutrients, uh, we can actually control it all through IoT devices. So we have pH sensors. We have EC sensors, temperature sensors that can all uh, change in real time to make sure the plants are not only getting what they need, but the best mix and the optimal mix of what they need. Uh, in terms of light, we provide we use LED lights to provide them the light. 
But again, that's an opportunity. You know, plants use lights for, for photosynthesis, but different plants need different wavelengths of light. You know, white light is a spectrum of colors. Just like we eat a particular mix of food, plants actually need a particular mix of wavelengths. And we, should, we can actually customize our LEDs down to the nanometer of wavelength, the intensity of that light, the duration of that light to be able to produce again, much more optimally. CO2, oxygen, oxygen controls, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I like to say we take the guesswork out of growing because this is all fed back into a central computer, which is managing all of the growing, which is managing all the climate controls. And so at the same time, we're bringing the skill level and the manual intervention level, which has a lot of risk, way, way down. And we're introducing a new skill set and a new type of uh, skill uh, kind of labor approach that's needed for agriculture that we haven't really seen before. Um, and thinking about what we at Madar Farms do. So he is a business we're focused across three main pillars. There's obviously the commercial growing side, which I'm gonna talk about, um, and you know the different texts that we use there. But that can't exist uh, and that can't scale without using our R&D in a way that's looped into it and that's continually feeding back into it. And I'll talk about that. And finally, of course, our educational outreach efforts and our community engagement efforts, which is the basis and the underlying foundation for everything we do, both from a responsibility point of view, but also about building the long-term future. And I'll talk about that in detail. So growing, what are the kind of basic methods that we use? So at a, at a very basic level, there are combination of hydroponics, vertical farming, and CEA. Hydroponics is very simple. I'm sure you all know it, but just in case, it's the growing of plants inside water. It's a way of delivering the nutrients to the plants and uh, using water instead of soil. Soil only acts as a medium for roots to grow and as a medium for nutrients to exist and for those roots to uptake those nutrients. But it's a very inefficient way of going about it because the plants have to, have to actually exert effort into getting those nutrients. They don't always get them in the most efficient manner. And of course, it's highly dependent on having the right soil, the right mixture, and managing that soil. Um, by using hydroponics, we're able to grow in places we weren't able to before, and we're able to deliver nutrients much more efficiently, and the plant uptake of that nutrient is much more efficient. We use vertical farming, and this is a very simplistic illustration of it, um, but think of it as going from a house to a skyscraper. Uh, this is just about maximizing land use and maximizing our productivity uh, per square meter or per square foot by adding layers one on top of the other. So when we're investing in the technology that's needed to control the environment, provide everything else, we're maximizing our productivity per single investment in whatever technology uh, there is. And finally, CEA, which I've already talked about, but it's just the extreme end of controlling our environment. So small things like uh, uh, you'll see here these air tubes, we've got altimeters. These all control even the wind uh, and air transfer and moisture and humidity within the environment. Being able to take every single aspect of growing and controlling it in a way to optimize. Now, uh, for us, what we did is we actually started off with a small container farm and we used that as kind of our building off ground, uh, learning uh, and being able to feed that knowledge and feed that kind of R&D continuous loop back and forth until we kind of perfected our, our recipes and our approaches. Today, we're building the region's first commercial indoor tomato farm uh, using LED lights. And I wanna, I, I wanna focus on the fact that it is a first, not just regionally, but, but globally. Um, the, the industry is very nascent globally. It's a, it's a growing industry. There's a lot of focus on it, but there's no gold standard. There's still no Amazon of this space. There's still no Google or Netflix of this space. And we're in a region of greatest opportunity. Uh, and so that provides us with an opportunity to become a center of excellence and to become a knowledge exporter. Uh, and the farm we're designing, I think what's most exciting for us is Aside from already the resource saving technology of hydroponics and vertical and recycling of water, we're actually creating 40% of our water needs inside the farm through uh, uh, capture technologies. Um, now, this is just a first uh, 
phase of our construction uh, at 5,000 square meters. We're actually expanding that out 10 times over uh, in the coming years um, and looking to take that forward in the future, inshallah. Um, I'm gonna skip this uh, over. Uh, I've already gone over a lot of this. Uh, I think the key takeaway is that in terms of our growing methods, again, we're able to control a lot of things, but actually the, by controlling them, there's a, there's a value added takeaway, uh, both in terms of consistency, both in terms of increasing our biomass, uh, in terms of increasing our nutrient levels or quality, and then translating that into a value proposition that's commercially viable and therefore allows us to be sustainable in the long run. Um, and that's where R&D comes in. You know, our R&D center is very much focused on tying it in with the needs of the market. So we talk to chefs, we talk to uh, Horeca partners, hotel restaurants, cafes, we talk to our retail partners, everyday customers, food influencers, pretty much across the entire spectrum of board. We ask them, is this a good enough product? What else is needed? Do we need to change the texture of it? Do we do you want taller plants? Do you want shorter plants? Do you want a plant that's slightly more sweet? Do you want a plant that's slightly crispier? Uh, and we're able to then take that feedback back in and, and, and adjust our growing. But R&D also means adjusting our packaging to increase our shelf life, uh, looking at different uh, polymer and composite materials uh, that may be cheaper, that may be more sustainable, uh, and building that back out. Um, and R&D is the backbone. You know, In this industry, it's typically been focused on leafy greens and microgreens, which is what we grow today. Like I said, we're expanding into tomatoes, and then we'll expand into strawberries, and we'll expand into other things, because once you hack the approach of the growing, once you hack the approach of entering this industry and the knowledge development portion, we're able to use that approach and scale that out with our SOPs or standard operating procedures into various other products. And by providing a wider product range, once we've acquired the customer, we're able to drive more impact into that funnel. And that's key when it comes to uh, being able to scale out impact. When we talk about scalability, um, that's really what we're talking about. Finally, in terms of education and community engagement, obviously there are great opportunities like today, uh, and like I mentioned, speaking at Expo and all the other obvious stuff. But when people ask me, what is our biggest challenge? Our, our biggest challenge is education and awareness. And the business that we're in, um, you know, I wish we were a SaaS company that was growing and in three years we could be super skilled, but we're in a business where it's gonna take not only one, two, three, four years, but it could take 10 years, 10 years plus, 20 years. And so the interventions we have to look at are also long-term. So what we went ahead and did was we created our own curriculum called the Sustainable Futures. And this is a curriculum where you can see we have small modular indoor farms installed in schools and educational institutes where uh, school children and higher education uh, uh, students can also actually farm uh, by themselves, have that hands-on learning and be able to impart to them. I think the takeaway, not, not, not just about food security, not just about this type of production, but what's possible? You know, what else is out there? What can we do? Uh, and what can you do with a very, very simple approach? Um, I have to say this is probably the most fulfilling part of the business for me when I see it, because when you see their eyes light up and then they understand that, hey, that's one portion. We can also look at blockchain and traceability. We can also look at artificial intelligence and vision control um, and seeing what's possible and seeing that you know, agriculture is something that can be quote unquote, exciting in a way that hasn't been seen before. Uh, from a personal point of view, you know, um, like Khalid said, I was a banker and a consultant and my family was very proud. And then I told them I was gonna become a farmer. And you could see the question marks, uh, emojis appear above their heads. You know, they're like, what? You're leaving all of this to sell lettuce? You know, that was kind of their connotation. Being able to change minds and mindsets, I think, is key to what we're doing in that part of the business. Um, so what does the future kind of hold? And I, and I think it's particularly promising, not just for us, inshallah, but for this country. You know, the UAE is the first country in the world and the only country actually that has a Ministry of Food Security. Um, there's a very clear vision about where they want to go over the next 30 years. 
uh, both in terms of increasing domestic production, but also by using technology to become much more sustainable. And we are well positioned as a national champion to both align ourselves with that vision, but also be a driving factor uh, in supporting the overall ecosystem. So we started off with just a container farm at Mustard City. Uh, we're expanding that out to a 5,000 square meter at Kizad, but we're actually looking to expand that out 10 times over. Our product variety today is in microgreens and mixed pack salads. Uh, we're expanding that on tomatoes, um, but we've actually grown over 150 different type of varieties in our facility and are looking to bring a lot of those online uh, into the market. And of course, as part of our R&D production, um, it's not just about internal production, but also about collaborating with universities and academic institutions to look at new crop varieties. And when I say here, I'm not just talking about fruits and vegetables, but I'm talking about indoor production of fish. I'm talking about algae production as a source of protein. I'm talking about animal feed production done sustainably so that we can impact the rest of the value chain. And so the opportunities are really boundless. And thinking about how this is relevant for you and what you can do, I think, you know, the obvious one is, you know, buy local, source local, eat local, because um, the retailers, the, the kind of gatekeepers, they're only going to change once or the community changes, once they start to ask for change. Um, I think most importantly is, uh, you know, on, on two points, like I, I always tell the team, I'm the, I'm the eater, I'm not the grower. Um, and, uh, you know, my background uh, and my studies, you know, I, I, I did economics, I did math, I did English classical studies, history. I, I didn't do agriculture. And yet uh, I'm very much hands into this field. I think challenging the perception of what background is needed in order to enter this field is something that I encourage you to reconsider. Um, and also just challenge commonly uh, accepted knowledge. You know, one of our continual conversations is, you know, the Dutch companies or Holland is seen as the global center of excellence for production. Uh, but because they've been doing it so long and they've been, because they've been doing it so long in a, in a certain method, uh, there's kind of a built-in bias about how to grow. And so we come to them and, you know, we have partners in, in, in Holland that we say, well, what about this? You know, it's almost like they've never considered it before. But it's because we're coming in with a fresh perspective and fresh eyes and really being able to ask, well, why not? And then trying to figure out and hack uh, the way about going about addressing that. Um, I, think most in, I think most importantly, it's just building your own knowledge level, building your own awareness level, and being able to take the action onto yourselves uh, to spread the message. Uh, that's our single most viral mechanism uh, for creating impact. Like I said at the start, knowledge and awareness is one of our biggest challenges. Being able to bring that bridge down, uh, that's the single most impactful thing we can do. Like I said, I was going to keep this concise. I hope I did as much as possible uh, so that I could leave as much room as possible for Q&A. Um, so I'm going to go quiet here, uh, allow you time to reminisce or uh, think about as needed, and I'm happy to address any questions or things that are on your mind. Thank you, Abdelaziz. That was really insightful. Um, so, uh, Whoever is ready with a question, please go ahead and, and unmute, unmute yourself and ask, or if you have a comment as well. Um, if you don't mind me going first. I have a question regarding the process of starting such a company in the UAE. Like, as you said, there is no uh, formula or that's set in stone as to how you should have an uh, agri-tech company in general, and more specifically in the uh, region. So how was the problem was it like more was it a good thing in your case with like it provides you flexibility and such or was it very difficult because there's no uniform standard and thus you found you know a lot of it was just figuring stuff out and failing and then like failing quickly and then fixing failing fixing failing fixing i think you decided what your standard is sure so a great question Leah. i'm glad you asked it uh, because a lot of the time when we present people see the end result uh, <clears throat> but uh, the journey is not necessarily always appreciated. Uh, and the answer is both. Uh, look, when I first started, um, uh, my story of starting was I was at McKinsey. Um, you know, I was working on a project uh, that looked at national security. I saw the numbers, I was terrified. Um, and I resigned the same week. And I then started traveling to see what's possible. Um, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, you know, 
uh, you know, started the company with not a clear strategy, but I knew something could be done. Um, and that was wonderful because it was a learning experience, not just for myself, but for the, for the supporting sector as well. It was a huge challenge to start up because there was no license and no business activity for what we were doing. So I remember going to municipality, going to DED, uh, going to the Ministry of Climate Change. And again, those question mark emojis would appear above people's heads because what I was describing, there was no understanding of it at the time. There was no license. Um, it took us almost a year to get the appropriate license. You know, uh, doesn't mean it stopped us. We went on agricultural land. We started with a small farm and we started anyway. And there was a learning process both internally and externally. Today, there's an advanced agricultural license that we're proud to say we helped create uh, alongside the ministry. Um, but, and it's not as hard as it used to be uh, as it was four and a half years ago when we first started. But I think the message that I would impart is regardless of this industry and the fact that the barriers are starting to fall down, it is very much a bang your head against the wall until you find the solution, whether it's between starting a business or anything else. A lot of the challenges that we face I would have never imagined if you gave me a year behind a computer to list every possible problem, I would not have covered the spectrum of problems uh, that we faced. I think the key takeaway is to really have a can-do attitude, uh, to really have that kind of entrepreneurial approach where, look, I have a vision, I have a problem statement that I want to solve, and I'm going to get there no matter what. And you're going to face problems no matter what it is across what scope. It's really having the attitude of, problem solving around that. And that is the case when we first started, that is the case a few years ago, and that's still the case today. It's just a different nature and a drastically different scale. I see, thank you so much. Um, if you don't mind me asking. Um, so uh, like, I believe that, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but like uh, sustaining the environment as in temperature and LED lights and wind and whatnot, it would require a lot of energy. So what I wanted to ask is, uh, how do you supply that energy? Is it like via solar power or um, fossil fuels? And another question is that, how does it compare um, quantitatively with uh, normal agricultural farming, like the energy usage between both methods? Sure, Mahat. So I think, first off, um, I wouldn't only think about energy. I would think about um, sustainability holistically, whether it's energy, whether it's food production, and whether it's water use. So for example, by producing locally, we're cutting down on a lot of food miles. By producing hydroponically, we're, solving, we're saving on a lot of water. Uh, but at the same time, you're absolutely right. We're using LED lights. We're using a lot of uh, cooling technology that is taking up quite a bit of water quite a bit of electricity versus your typical outdoor uh, kind of production methods. So first off, we have to find the common denominator and a common way of uh, comparing across uh, sectors. So for us, the easiest way to look at it is in CO2 emissions, because that's a common language or a common factor that we can compare across. Uh, so first off, as far as electricity goes, um, in terms of let's say kilowatt hours per kilograms to give you a scale, if we look at a super low scale, low end poly house, you know, your typical structure here in the UAE, you're only really using 0 0.3 kilowatt hours per kilogram. Um, you know, your high tech greenhouse, maybe 17. On the other hand, we're using 36. So we're using double as much as your high tech greenhouse and almost 10 times as much as your typical poly house. But then if you look at water uh, in terms of liters per kilogram uh, used, um, poly houses use 120 liters per kilogram. Our high-tech greenhouse uses 80 liters per kilogram. We use four. So the, the X difference there is much larger. Um, and in terms of yield on top of that, um, you know, your average poly house, we're probably looking at about 20, 20 to 23 uh, kilograms per square meter per year. A high-tech greenhouse, you may be looking at 38, 39, whereas we're looking at 65 uh, because we're able to optimize. And so you can't really take it as like one, even in terms of labor, you know, your poly house will take six people, your high tech greenhouse will take eight people. We only need two or three people to run it. Um, and so our electricity usage is higher relative uh, to kind of other structures, but we save so much more and much more sustainable in other areas that the over sustainability impact is much higher. 
Having said that, um, we still have to take into consideration, uh, given our mission statement, our vision statement, how can we bring down electricity use? And so we invest a lot of our R&D in terms of, well, what's the most efficient, um, for example, in terms of air exchange, um, because we actually uh, control our, our climate so much, typically you have to expel all of here, bring that back in and recool it uh, in a high tech greenhouse. We would rather invest extra in the infrastructure for air scrubbers, for uh, HEPA filters, et cetera. And that investment actually allows us to bring down our electricity usage significantly, where our air exchange is zero per day. We actually don't, uh, uh, don't exfiltrate that because the investment we make in climate controls is much higher. Uh, today, we're at 30% renewable energy at Kizan. That'll go up to 50% in the next three years uh, as part of the grid. Uh, having said that, when I look at, uh, I have to look at it as a business as well. And I think about uh, ROI on dollar spend or ROI on debt on spend, um, not just in terms of a business, but also in terms of sustainability. So if we think about it as ROI in terms of CO2 spend per dollar, my impact is much greater on food production investment than it is on investing more in renewable energy. We have to focus our, our, our resources on what we do best. Our value proposition is growing more sustainably and better than everybody else. We trust and we're working, and part of the reason we chose Kizad as a location is their commitment to shifting the grid to renewable energy. In the meantime, however, we've made a commitment to carbon offset to become carbon neutral as part of, uh, let's say, bridging the gap until that journey is complete. So I would say it's a uh, two-way approach of uh, making sure that we've got our uh, finger on the pulse and able to kind of bridge the gap in the short term, and making sure in the long term, again, our R&D investments are aligned with our long-term sustainability needs. Thank you. I have a question. Um, so was it a challenge for you to convince people that indoor produce is as good, if not better? Heba, I wish uh, you could, uh, without my petra, you could see my hair before I started and when I, where I am now. Uh, my wife is not very happy at all. Uh, it's absolutely a challenge, not only before, but, uh, but today as well. Uh, I think first off, the biggest example is uh, labeling. <clears throat> because we grow in water, um, so the organic certification in the UAE, in order to qualify for it, you have to grow in animal fecal matter, organic nutri nutrients uh, or soil, uh, or you have to import it from abroad uh, with uh, an organic certification. Those are your only two paths for organic certification. Because we grow in water, therefore, even though we use organic nutrients, even though we may use organic seeds, that doesn't qualify us in any way, shape or form. However, if you test our product, and this is tested by municipality, MOH, et cetera, we've got higher nutrient levels, We've got, lower, uh, we've got lower pathogen levels and zero pesticides or insecticides. So we're actually much cleaner and much healthier um, and obviously much better for the environment aside from being better for you. Um, so we can certify as organic. In the States, they've allowed it. They've actually certified it as organic 2.0, um, but we can claim that here. And so over the last couple of decades, there's been this marketing machine of organic is better. Um, but organic still uses pesticides. Organic still uses insecticides. It may be better than traditional agriculture, but there's still a step up to be done. So one of the most frustrating questions I get is, well, why don't you sell organic? And that's when I want to start pulling my hair out because what we do offer is, is a better value proposition. Now that's an example, but I think the takeaway is whenever you're introducing something new, whenever, uh, wherever you are sort of across the technology curve, you have to find the right audience. Today, we're early in the industry and we're early in the audience. So we have to look for our early adopters. We have to look at the people who are already aware of the industry, already aware of the issue. We have to target them as kind of our customers, but also our champions and our partners to be able to spread the message. And of course, once they try our produce, once they're convinced, that becomes a viral kind of growth mechanism in and of itself. Uh, but at the same time, that becomes why we invest so much in terms of our education and our outreach and awareness efforts. Um, I will say, however, uh, in particular in our industry, in particular with food, um, it is a challenging aspect. And so we have to invest, I think, much more than in other industries. And we would not be able to validate that or do that 
if we didn't have a large scale output uh, in mind. Um, you know, if we were limiting ourselves to say half a hectare or a hectare, uh, we wouldn't be able to build the kind of brand awareness or brand affiliation that's needed to communicate the value. Um, hope that answers your question, Hope. Thank you. Um, um, my question, I thought, who is it? Jeninza, you can go ahead. No, to have you. All right, so yeah, my question was just that, you know, this is kind of an assumption, but obviously I think the cost of maintenance of um, your kind of farming would be higher in comparison to the traditional kind of farming. And I just want to ask that this uh, higher cost of maintenance and the effect it would have on your prices and therefore the reaction that you receive from your consumers, would they be willing to sort of pay maybe a higher price just because it's better for them in comparison to the traditional kind of farming? Sure, Tahani. So uh, great question. I'll try that, I'll tie that back also to what Eva was asking. So first off, in terms of maintenance, um, actually our maintenance cost is, is lower than your traditional farms because if we invest in the right SOPs, what I mean by SOPs is a list of working instructions. So, you know, our farmers know that once a week they have to go in, they have to calibrate the sensors. We do it once a week instead of doing it once every two months, um, which is, you know, your typical uh, farm because we want to avoid the replacement costs. We want to avoid higher maintenance costs. Um, we invest a lot in our hygiene control. So we're HACCP certified, hazard analysis and critical control points. That's typically you see for large industrial manufacturers or hospitals because we want to prevent pathogen entrance, we want to prevent insect entrance. So our maintenance cost is slightly lower there. However, our, let's say overall OPEX, uh, you know, again, spending on electricity, spending in other areas is higher. Um, and so our cost of production is higher than, than your traditional uh, agriculture. And this is key to what I said about choosing the right product uh, in terms of what you wanna produce. When we chose our product portfolio, there was actually a filtration process we went through. You know, what is uh, something that the way we grow has an edge? You know, if I grow a better potato, it doesn't really matter to you or the end consumer. If I grow a better onion or a better carrot, those are root vegetables. Um, I can grow a watermelon, but a watermelon is going to cost me 120 dirhams a kilo. No one's going to buy a watermelon for 120 plus, no matter how sweet it tastes. So being able first off to find a financially feasible uh, product that we have an edge over. And then tying it in with national security, because this is part of the national security agenda of the country and the region, because that's very key to us from a mission, mission and vision point of view. And then finally, are we ready to grow it? And what we end up is the subset of a product portfolio. We then go to market and what is our goal? Our goal is not to displace local production. And we believe there's a place for polyhouse, greenhouse and outdoor uh, growing. And we support farmers in that. And there's a lot of knowledge that we disseminate in that area. Our goal is to displace imports. So when you look at imports that are being brought in from Holland, that are being bought in from Italy or France or various areas of the world, um, they're priced at a premium of anywhere between one and a half to sometimes five X local produce. Yes, there's the perceived higher quality because they're growing in an environment that is more, uh, let's say natural or uh, easier to grow in than our arid environment. Um, but we can replicate that environment today in our farms through, through this controlled environment agriculture approach. And so when we look at it that way, when we look at import substitution, we cost either equal to or less than that, but at a much higher quality because we're not freezing them, transporting them thousands of miles and getting it to the end customer. Having said all of that, back to Hibbe's point, we still have to educate the customer and invest in making sure that they realize that that value proposition is there. They realize that you're, we're not your typical UAE outdoor or poly house farm, that we're actually better than your imported Dutch tomatoes, that we're better than your French Lolo Biondo lettuce, um, which you know we're importing in massive volumes, but how do we do that in a way that we're communicating it to the end customer? Uh, I think that's a part of the business that falls under our growth strategy and making sure our marketing messaging our labeling uh, and our targeting uh, is done in the right way. And again, falling back to that feedback loop of making sure we're addressing kind of the low hanging fruit, we're addressing what's needed the most uh, and easing our journey in that way.
that makes that answers. perfect sense. Yeah, it Great. makes perfect sense. Thank you. And before anyone else jumps in, I think Janandu, you had a question. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to ask about uh, food scarcity, uh, global food scarcity as a whole. Um, so the WFP has like a almost $8.5 billion budget. And do you think it's the responsibility of the World Food Program to solve uh, the energy, uh, to solve the food crisis or is this the responsibility for all uh, onto innovators like yourself? And also, do you believe that uh, this budget that the WFP says is not still not enough. Do you believe that this budget is better spent on uh, sustainable farming methods such as uh, the method that you employ? Sure. So uh, I'll answer your question, but I'll add a few more points. So I think first off, <clears throat> technically speaking, we actually do produce enough food to feed the world. Uh, if you're looking at basic level production across the globe, the problem is in getting it to the end customer we're not getting enough food to them in a price accessible way uh, and in a way where the food is staying fresh. As an example, one of the countries we looked at uh, when I was at McKinsey, 82%, 82% of food that was being produced and imported was wasted before it got to the end customer. So by wasted, I mean it was expired because it wasn't shelved properly, it wasn't cooled properly, it wasn't handled properly. And we have to deal with this too, you know, uh, small example, you know, the driver drops it off at the supermarket, he's leaving the door open. You leave the door open for 15 minutes and 40 Celsius weather, that's gonna have an impact. Um, you know, so the challenge is not just about food production, it's, it's across the value chain. Second, um, 8.5 billion is a drop in, in the ocean. Uh, it's beyond the drop in the ocean. You know, think about the numbers I shared and think about the fact that you know, you've got more than 8 billion people on the planet. Um, you know, I, I think that in and of itself, you know, it, it, it's not really moving uh, the needle. But you have to think about where do we invest that 8.5 billion? Where is our biggest multiplier effect? Is it in introducing uh, small digital sensors and IoT devices for smallhold farmers in India, which is 50% of the global small farmer foothold, or in Africa, which is 40% of the global uh, small farmer? Is it in knowledge dissemination? Is it in getting the customer to ask for change and therefore you know, communicating upwards uh, and forcing everybody else to change? And that brings me to my final point, which is it's not a one player responsibility. Um, you know, it is very much a holistic uh, approach that's both needed and warranted. We would not exist if the problem didn't exist. But we wouldn't be able to succeed if people like you didn't go into the supermarket and look for our products. We would not be able to succeed if the government wasn't able and willing to be able to support a policy change that allowed us. Uh, we would not succeed if there wasn't someone who had developed these technologies in different industries and we're looking at applying them in this approach. And so I think it's a holistic involvement across community, policymakers, um, growers themselves, retailers, and people across the entire value chain. When you look at the scale of this problem, um, it's not something that a single player can, can, can provide. One of the questions I got on a panel yesterday at Expo was, um, you know, I was on a panel with some of our quote unquote competitors. They said, you guys all seem friendly with each other and you seem like you get along. We said, absolutely, because we don't see each other as competitors. Yes, we're, we're, we're selling similar products, we're doing similar things, but the problem we're addressing, if all of us become billion dollar plus companies, we're still, this much of the market, because the market is so big, the problem is so big, collaboration and addressing and getting things changed in the way that we need will generate a greater return. Um, so Danando, I hope that answers your question, but it's, uh, it's across the board. Thank you so much. Um, I also had a quick question, um, unless, unless Nicholas wants to go first, he can. Um, okay, I think I think, you I think took your, I put your mic uh, not on mute first, so you can go first. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah? Okay, sorry about that. Um, but I was just wondering, so you mentioned in the presentation that regardless of what major you are, regardless of what you study, you can enter like the ag tech sector. Um, and like for you personally, if you started off like 
and finance, uh, did you already have some sort of background in this field that like made you comfortable to start this? Or did you have like a team with you that like initiated this? And like for someone who like I personally, like I don't really see myself really studying anything related to tech, but like I am really interested in this industry. And like, what are some ways people who are not very, I don't know, tech, like tech intrigued um, can still be a part of it? I get it. I think uh, I think that's a very valid question. So first off, I you know I love Zoom talks um, because they cut me off here, which is about the best portion of profile I have. When you start to go down, you start to see how large my stomach is, and I start to kind of look much much less inspiring. Let's say. Um, so that's about the level of expertise that I brought into this industry was the fact of how familiar I was with food. Um, and uh, the fact that I'd worked on a project thinking about the challenges in the region. Uh, that's really the extent of the, of the expertise I brought here. And, um, you know, it, it, it was a massive challenge to build that knowledge, but honestly, I was so, so driven, um, so inspired by this message. And I really felt that I had this responsibility by being made aware that I had to do something. So when we first started, we imported this container with a fully built farm. And I spent two years inside that farm. Um, I spent two years, you know, I remember Ramadan having futur inside the farm, having suhoor inside the farm. You know, uh, of course, during Ramadan, we'd play uh, only Quran to our plants uh, to make them halal plants. But outside of Ramadan, we'd play classical music. Um, and I would farm myself. And I made all the same mistakes. I made every single fault that you could imagine. But I took the produce. I grew produce. And I took it to market. And I remember driving in my car and I would buy these little ice bags to keep them fresh because I didn't know anything about cold cake storage at the time. And I would knock on the door and wild in the moon and on slices and all these kind of uh, Tom and Surge. And I would try and sell. Um, and I would turn down a lot. Um, and some people would take me in for a meeting because they were interested. Um, and I started to learn. And I started to learn. And we were a very small team when we first started. It was just me and then me and one person and then me and three people for a couple of years. Um, and then about two years ago, we started scaling up the team. We've got almost 20 people. Um, but the background of the people that we've hired, some of them do have agricultural backgrounds. So our on-the-ground farmers are agricultural engineers because it's easier for us in terms of training. But our head of operations, his background is actually aerospace manufacturing. So what he used to do before was he used to build satellites. He knew nothing about food, but he was so bored and so unfulfilled with what he was doing. Uh, you know, he saw this article in the National uh, about what we were doing. He emailed me. We met up for a cup of coffee. Um, he just wanted to see what was up. Uh, a week later, he emailed me. He's like, can I join you guys? And we needed somebody with his background, and he joined. And what he brings to us is he brings a just-in-time approach, a Toyota car manufacturing, aerospace manufacturing approach. And that's the way we approach our agriculture, you know, controlling everything, looking at it like a manufacturing or an assembly line. We look, we look at ourselves not as growers, but as electricity providers, because that's what we are. But with, with perfecting the environment, that's our growing. Uh, by maintaining all these technology aspects, that's what we're doing. The growing element, we partnered with people. We learned from people. We hired agriculture engineers. But that didn't stop me from starting off at the start. Um, you know, our head of growth, her background is in computational linguistics, nothing to do with sales or marketing, but, and she wasn't looking for a job. She had recently retired. She recently had kids. She heard about us through a marketing agency that we were working with. She reached out to me because she was interested about the concept. Three weeks later, she started with us and it's been three and a half years. Um, and most of our team members have come in that way. I think what is common throughout all those stories is the fact that we were all uh, joined together by our passion for what is possible and by our passion for addressing this particular problem. I think my advice to you, Eve, would be if you find something that you're truly passionate about, regardless of the skill set, you can build it. I don't know if this is, I'm supposed to say this in a university setting, but um, look, I have a bachelor's in economics and astrophysics. My minors are in math, classical studies, history, and English. Nothing is an act. And to be honest, nothing I learned from a content point of view at university has been relevant for the rest of my life, whether it was banking or consulting. What was relevant was the way I learned at university. 
What was relevant was the skills that I picked up at university. What was relevant were the ideas that I was exposed to. What was relevant was the people and inspiration that I was exposed to. I think if you take that mindset and you take it forward, uh, I think that's the most important. Again, I apologize if I ruffle any feathers, but that's kind of the, the mentality that, that I go uh, about it with. Hi, Nicholas. Hello. Excellent talk, excellent topic, and nice approach. Thank you very much for that. I, I have a question. I'm coming from robotics and automation background, and you said that you have a variety of people from different backgrounds. I want to know today, are you using any kind of uh, technologies like deep learning, AI, uh, or automated system, mobile robots, and this, this kind of technologies to improve your production? And if yes, can you share a few examples? Sure. So first off, the quick answer is no today. Um, so again, when I think about uh, what I've said earlier, we have to think about ROI on R&D spend, ROI on CapEx spend. And today, the low-hanging fruit in the industry, we don't need that kind of automation. We don't need that kind of robotics to capture that market. And we want to do it as fast as possible. Having said that, we keep our pulse on what's possible. And as we scale up, volatility in kind of the manual labor, being able to control quality control that and quality assurance becomes much more important. And that's where automation and robotics and AI start to become more important. So in our first facility that's being built, the scale-up facility that I talked about in Kizad, or in microgreens, that's actually a fully automated facility. So the only intervention is putting seeds in, and then you put the trays, everything else is completely automized on a tray system that comes out and that gets packaged and is ready to go. But that's a very simple, let's say, level one uh, robotized system. As we move forward, we will look at upskilling some of those things, but it really depends on ROI. Uh, it depends on the financial implication. Uh, specifically, deep learning and artificial intelligence, that's, the, that's, I would say, the most promising area, much more so than robotics or automation for us, uh, specifically because one of our biggest risks for us, given we don't use insecticides and pesticides, is making sure our insect pest management, our hygiene control, is incredibly high. Prevention is much easier than curing. And um, this is not just for us, obviously, but this is every single farm out there has to deal with pathogens. Um, today, the most promising area is building up data sets for vision control systems that can pick up early detection of pathogens so we can take care of them early before they spread. Now, what's been limiting uh, the industry today, I think is a combination of two things. One is very low level of data sets. Anywhere you see globally, the data sets are minimal in order to really drive any sort of clear indication. Uh, a lot of people are working on it, but tech developers and growers, there's still kind of that gap and disconnect. And those partnerships only just starting to happen in a way that's bringing a rich enough data set for those uh, uh, kind of AI models and vision models to, to be meaningful. I think the second thing is um, most vision control systems today and the kind of level of recognition that we're at would look at macroclimate environments. Macroclimate, I can already do that, um, and I don't need the level of technology uh, with vision control. But what I need is microclimate intervention. What I need is at the leaf level. And now we're starting to see both cameras that are available that are capable of doing that, but the different sensors, whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, IR, whether it's UV, whatever it may be, that are capable of picking up those, uh, those kind of data inputs. Tying that in um, with the data set, I think we will reach a critical point at some point, a tipping point, where it becomes worth, in, worth investing. Uh, I think the final question that comes out of that is, do we do that or do we rely on somebody else? For us, our vision statement is, if we can do it cheaper, if we can do it more efficiently, if we can do it faster than somebody else, we'll do it. But if it's of a core competency that's outside of ours, that somebody else can do, then we should not be wasting our resources there. Instead, a partnership is a much more efficient way to go about it. And when it comes specifically to robotics, automation, and vision control systems, that's our approach. That's something where we've partnered with companies like Philips and Signify, uh, Artemis, and various other kind of startups, uh, Goliaths and startups in the industry, where we're saying, hey, you want to come test in our farms? You want to come build your data sets in our farms? Doors wide open, but that becomes proprietary to us down the road when your systems become viable.
Uh, and so keeping a pulse on the industry, I think for us there specifically is much more important. Can I, can I continue a little bit with my you, question? You can continue, Nicholas. Okay, so uh, thank you for the, for the answer that you gave us. Uh, are you interested to discuss prototyping some functions using these technologies? So for example, the lab that I'm working on, we have like mobile robots that as you said, they can go and in a specific point and take a specific item like a leaf as you said so you don't need to have like hand cameras with high resolution uh, specific specification but you have one and a mobile robot that can go around and do an inspection would you be interested for for such a discussion i, I think not only are you open for that discussion but we already have those discussions so we are part of a virtual research institute as part of ADIC. We've actually already partnered with a local UAE university that's being funded by the government. Okay. We're also partnering with other universities, not only locally, but internationally. And our preference is always to have local talent. So if you want to drop us an email, I'm sure a person called Kyle Wagner, our head of ops, will connect with you, or Sagar, who is our continuous improvement leader. You want to put something in our farm? As long as you don't disturb our no. workflow, you're more than welcome to it. And as long as you sign over your IP and your soul, we're good to go. And, and another thing, I don't know I, I, if I've, I've been visit a company in Germany that they make um, genetically modified uh, seeds. And what they do, they're using automation high throughput screening to accelerate the, the test that to find the right specification for the seed, right? Yeah. Have, you, have you thought this kind of approach? Which of yeah, automation. So, this is not automation. It's not automation. No, it's it's seed breeding. So, um, so to your point, you know, seed breeding is you know ninety eight percent controlled by two companies in the world. Uh, you know, the one side of Bayer, basically. And seed breeding has typically been a very slow approach. Uh, it takes you know a big data set to start with, a genetic bank to start with, and it takes decades to go about it. One of the breakthroughs has been automation and AI and machine learning in allowing us to kind of accelerate that approach. Um, and it's very, very important for us because typically seeds have been bred for outdoor growing. They've been bred for greenhouse and polyhouse structures, i.e. they've been bred for disease resilience, uh, climate resilience. That's not important for us. I actually want a seed that is more sensitive, but will have a higher yield production or will have a sweeter product production, will have a higher sugar content. I don't care if it's more susceptible to disease because my climate control, my hygiene control, that's taking care of the disease part. Um, and so seed breeding is actually one of our biggest lever of improvements, much more so than anything that you just discussed. Unfortunately, it's not something that we would do internally. I think that's something we would partner with because that's a, that's a data set that where we need plant geneticists um, and we need food scientists uh, at a doctorate level to kind of do that and drive that research. Um, so I think we'd look at a university partnership for that. And I think the promising thing there is less genetically modified, less um, kind of machine learning, much more the uh, uh, use of CRISPR technologies. Um, I won't get too into that though, because I can kind of go down the scientific uh, rabbit hole. Uh, what I will say is you have to be careful about the messaging of that because I think in this academic environment, we can appreciate and bandy the value of that. I think with the general population, uh, to Heba's point, you know, educating about the indoor growing, I think uh, you know, we don't want to complicate that message too much. Uh, and we have to counterbalance kind of our market value, our actual production needs, um, you know, and the uh, biggest uh, return on you. Thank you very much, excellent. Thank you, Nicholas. Anyone else with a question? We can take, I think, one more question. Uh, I was wondering uh, what kinds of opportunities you provide for students at universities instead of like, you know, researchers and such, like, do you have the uh, option for like maybe internships or any of such roles, um, like whether paid or non-paid regardless, like just any, uh, opportunities you provide for sure. students. Sure, so um, I think two quick answers. I think one is if it's ever unpaid, I'll never say no to free labor. Um, you know, that's something I'll always take on. Um, uh, secondly, 
um, we are trying to develop a formalized program, but we are a startup and it's one of those things that kind of keeps dropping because we've got so much on our plate. However, um, beyond what you've said, we're kind of more arms wide open about people reaching out to us. Um, because we're so accessible, we always say the responsibility and the onus is on you. Um, but I'll give you a great example. One of your colleagues, uh, Benji, actually at, at NYU, reached out to us about a year and a half ago uh, for an internship um, and started working with us uh, for a month. Um, you know, that was at school. And then she's kept on working with us for a whole year throughout his academic year. And some of the work he produced is actually in our sustainable futures curriculum and is actually being deployed in schools. Uh, and it's an example of someone who came in because he was interested. He's like, look, I've got this extra time. And he stayed with us for a whole year and has had a meaningful impact on the organization. And, you know, we've been kind of courting him and trying to get him to join us uh, after graduating. But I think, uh, uh, I think that's, uh, that's an internal team discussion about whether he'll, uh, uh, whether he'll join us or not. But look, arms wide open, but the responsibility falls on you to kind of reach out and, and push for it. Uh, one advice I would give you and everybody here, it's advice I give to my team and everybody in life. If it's important enough for you, to, for, for someone else to listen to, and it's important enough for you to push for it. Um, that's something that I've found as a kind of key key message for myself uh, for success. It's something I always impart to others. I see. Thank you so much. And is there any way we can connect to you, like through LinkedIn or uh, just? Sure. You can try you... message me on LinkedIn. Unfortunately, uh, I don't reply because I hate social media. I'm only on LinkedIn because my head of growth forced me to be on it. Uh, I have no social media presence. I'm not on Facebook, I'm on Instagram. I believe social media is the devil. Having said that, our company is on all of the social media channels. Uh, we do have an info email that you can uh, reach out to. Um, and we are a very responsive team. And Tamara, who is also on this call, and I believe the team has her contact information. Uh, I'm willing for her contact information to be given out so you can bombard her uh, with all of the questions. And I'm sure she's cringing as I say this. Uh, thank, thank you, so. Abdelaziz. Thank, thank you, Abdelaziz, for this very uh, insightful and very entertaining uh, talk uh, as well. Um, thank you so much for being very generous with your time and your knowledge. I'm sure that everyone here really, really enjoyed this. Um, and we hope to you know, see you in the future, perhaps collaborate or have some of our students uh, you know, come your way as well. Yeah, I hope so too. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure. Thanks for all, everybody for being engaged and uh, being able to have a fruitful conversation. And, uh, you know, like I said, arms wide open. If there's any future opportunities, we're uh, always here to collaborate and listen. Uh, but thank you for having me. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a wonderful day and a weekend, everyone. Bye-bye.